Hello everyone, my name is Peter Wise Jackson and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Missouri Botanical Garden. It's my honour and pleasure to be president of the garden and I want to say how much we miss you all in the garden uh, at the moment during this time of crisis. We have closed the garden as you, as you will all know because we, we simply cannot keep safe our staff, our volunteers and our visitors and all of the people who love the garden. And we know that you miss the garden very much, but we want to bring you uh, some messages from the garden, some videos, so that at least you can be here in spirit if you aren't here in person. We are so grateful for your continued support because, you know, we could not continue to sustain this garden, even without uh, your, your presence here, without all of the wonderful support you give us. The garden is beautiful at all times of the year. In spring, it's a particular favorite for so many of you. And I hope you will continue to support us with your memberships, with your gifts, and uh, show us uh, your, in the way that you continue to love the garden as we all do. Thank you so much for your support and we look forward to having you back in the garden before too long. One of the things I want to do with you now is to bring you on a short walk uh, in one of my favorite parts of the garden to show you some of the plants that interest me and tell you a little bit about them. We are here in the stumpery at the garden, which is a wonderful feature that we created uh, newly, just a few years ago. And many people say to me, what on earth is a stumpery? Well, the best way to describe it is like a rock garden, except we use tree stumps rather than rocks. Traditionally, stumperies are in shaded places. And behind me, we have a large Zelkova tree, uh, an elm relative, uh, which comes from the Caucasus, which provides the ideal dappled shade for a strumpery like this. We have about a hundred stumps uh, in the garden and we've planted it with, uh, with ferns, with uh, spring flowers, uh, woodland spring flowers, and a whole range of things, and I'm going to show you some of them. The, apparently the largest stumpery in the world is in a garden in Washington State and it is 9,000 square feet. We're slightly smaller than that, but we have as many stumps as they have there. Our stumpery is made up entirely of stumps that came from Shaw Nature Reserve, our nature reserve about 30 miles west of the garden in Franklin County, uh, where we took out uh, eastern red cedars some years ago to, to restore uh, limestone blades and the stumps waited there until we found a great use for them, bringing them into the garden to create the stumpery that we have around us today. And it is a beautiful area, uh, one to walk in in the gentle shade of the spring sunlight. This is one of my favorite plants. It's a favorite because I grew up with it in my home garden uh, in Ireland many years ago. My, my mother always called it uh, soldiers and sailors. Uh, soldiers because of the beautiful red flowers and the sailors because of the blue flowers on the same head. But it's also, its scientific name is pulmonaria, uh, referring to the, the, the lung, uh, also called, I mean, many of you will know it as lungwort, and that's so-called because the leaves look as if they were, uh, it was a section through a diseased lung. And because in, in times past, many people believed that uh, if a, the part of a plant looked like a, a, one of the human organs, then that contained uh, possible cures for different ailments related to the, the lung. Uh, lung wort, wort, any plant that has the name wort, means that it was probably used for medicinal purposes in the past. And pulmonaria officinalis, officinalis is also a name, a scientific name that goes with a plant that was used for medicinal purposes um, of the office officinalis, uh, which means, uh, which refers to a, uh, a pharmacist uh, who would have had these plants used for um, medicinal purposes in times past, 
particularly in Europe. The daffodils are beginning to go over in the gardens now because they are one of the great harbinger, harbingers of spring. But I like this one growing here in the stumpery because it has this beautiful uh, salmon pink corona. Uh, daffodils belong to the genus Narcissus and you may know Narcissus who was a, uh, a Greek youth in mythology who fell in love with his own reflection in the water. He became so fond of his own reflection, so enamored with it, that in staring into the pond he fell in and was drowned. Uh, and from that pond uh, sprouted a, a beautiful plant, a narcissus, uh, which bears his name. The, these are really pretty unique because it has this amazing structure in the flower called a corona. Nothing to do with the virus. Uh, the virus actually has, a, has a, a shape that looks like a crown around it. But this is a, an outgrowth from the base of the daffodil down below, which is unique to uh, the narcissus and characterizes them. And it is not part of the petals, it's not part of the sepals or, or, or stamens, but comes out of the lower part, the hypanthium, so-called, and is a, uh, an organ that is found uh, in a very special way in the Narcissus uh, group. This is another little uh, pretty woodland flower, the Siberian buglus. It's called the Siberian buglus, but it actually occurs in in Turkey, which is certainly not Siberia, but you can never really rely on the common names to describe uh, what something is in a, or where it comes from, because it's just a name. The, this uh, plant, Brunera macrophylla, macrophylla because it has large leaves, uh, and the, the, the large leaves give it its alternate common name, which is ox tongue, uh, because the, the, the leaves are just rough and hairy and imagine what an ox's tongue might be like, uh, rough and uh, if it was to lick you. Very pretty little blue flowers, a bit like a forget-me-not, which open up pink and then open to have these five spreading petals. It grows very well in woodlands, it's easy to cultivate and to maintain. Here is a beautiful little uh, ground cover plant, an epimedium. Uh, it is sometimes called bishop's hat because it has these little uh, flowers that the, the bracts or sepals below the, the petals spread out beyond it and make it look a little bit like an old-fashioned bishop's hat, a uh, four-cornered hat which bishops apparently would wear in the past. I haven't seen a bishop wearing one recently. There is, um, these are uh, members of the um, Berberus family, surprisingly, because most of us know Berberus as being a, a quite a large garden shrub. But these are ground cover and wonderful for covering uh, in a woodland garden like this and keep down the weeds as well. It's a pretty plant. There is uh, lots of different ones which can be grown with different colored flowers and leaf sizes and so on. Uh, there is a, there's a hybrid near me which is not in flower at the moment, but its, its name is Canterbrigensi, and uh, uh, derived from the name Canterbury. And so it should be called the Archbishop's Hat in this case, because the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, certainly I don't think would wear one of these as a hat, but it's very pretty. Here is another of my favorite plants. Uh, it's a favorite because when I was growing up, we would go out on Sunday afternoons and have a picnic into the countryside. And a favorite spot was a, a meadow that had this plant in it, Primula varus, the cowslip. And uh, it has, uh, many of you will know the ordinary primrose, which has uh, broad spreading petals. Uh, this is like it, they're, except they're smaller and they're uh, uh, peeking out from a sheath of sepals below. This, in, in an Irish context, this is a, an important plant in uh, folk medicine in the past. People would boil up the, uh, the flowers, and indeed sometimes the whole plant, roots and all, 
and use it, drink the water from it and it would cure stomach ailments and asthma and all sorts of things and who am I to say whether it works or not. Uh, it's also been used to make wine, uh, uh, Primula Veris wine is delicious to drink and you can make a syrup out of it to um, boiling the flowers and adding a little bit of sugar and making a syrup. Uh, children in the past also would pick many of these and uh, stick them into something and make a, a primrose ball or a cowslip ball uh, which they could play with. Uh, but now in so many of the meadows where it used to be common they have been spread with artificial fertilizers and nitrogen so when uh, when that happens, this plant in the wild cannot compete with the grasses and it's become much rarer. Here in the garden, we have a, a nice little population doing very well and reminds me of my childhood. This is a wonderful view over the stumpery and you can see the great mixture of woodland plants and ferns all doing extremely well in the dappled shade under the Zelkova tree. We're going to move out from the stumpery now into the bright sun and enjoy some of the spring uh, sunshine that we have today. And I'll show you a few more plants. People are always surprised when I say that I love dandelions. They are a weed, but they still, if they were hard to grow, we would all want them in our gardens. The dandelion is is common throughout the United States, but uh, in Europe it is native. Uh, if I'm holding what looks like one flower, I'm not. I'm actually, these heads are made up of numerous flowers, each one uh, clustered together in uh, a composite head. And I could pull off uh, individual ones and those would be the flowers. When they uh, turn to, when they go to seed and the, and the flowers fade, then they are replaced by the uh, seed heads, which are sometimes called dandelion clocks. And growing up as a child, we could tell the time because you could blow them. And the number of blows it took to disperse all of the seeds would tell you what time of the day it was. You had to blow really hard if, if it was a, um, one o'clock and time for lunch. The dandelion, apart from being very pretty, is a really, really useful plant. Every part of it can be used for numerous things. The flowers, uh, you can boil them uh, and um, make them into a syrup, add sugar to the water that's left over, and it makes a delicious wildflower honey, uh, dandelion honey. You boil the whole plant as well, and it makes a, a good uh, drink. Uh, don't, you don't eat the, all the plants, you just drink the water that's, that they've bo been boiled in. It makes a really good uh, tonic for the stomach. Uh, the, if you have warts, you can pluck the stems and the white latex that drips out is a good way of getting rid of warts. The roots, you can dig them up, chop them and roast them, and it makes a good caffeine-free substitute for coffee. The, the leaves are also very edible and particularly in the early spring are very mild and go nicely in salads or they can be steamed as well and used as a vegetable. Altogether it's an extremely useful plant and rather than complaining about it in your garden or in your lawn you can use the plant uh, uh, for, for experimenting with all sorts of culinary purposes. Normally you wouldn't see them in the Missouri Botanical Garden because we're pretty good at keeping out the weeds uh, but uh, during this time when we were all uh, locked up in our homes, the, uh, we don't cut the grass as frequently as, as we would wish. And, uh, and so the dandelions have taken their chance to come up here and there in the garden. But uh, they will be gone by the time you all come back. This is a wonderful small tree that's native to the United States. It's the Carolina Allspice. It's found in uh, woodlands. It's quite a low growing tree or perhaps even a large shrub in some cases. And it occurs from Florida right up to Virginia. Uh, 
and that's the only place it's, it's found native in the wild. It has these fascinating red flowers. They faded a little bit here and they're more brown, but in, earlier on they would be bright red or perhaps they'll get bright red later for some of the ones that are still in bud. It's called allspice because it was actually used in the past as a substitute for allspice, used for, for in culinary purposes for flavoring. Because if you strip off the bark and you grind it up, it has a, gives a flavor of cinnamon. So it's a good, good substitute for cinnamon. And indeed, when you get the leaves and you crush them, they have a, a mild cinnamon aroma to them. Be careful though, because the flowers and the fruits of this are poisonous. So uh, don't take my word for it, um, just use it with care. A fascinating native tree from the United States. One last plant before we leave the, the stumpery and the woodland plants. And this one uh, I always know as uh, Dicentra spectabilis, but it's changed its name recently. Uh, it's Lamprook capnus uh, now, but it's much easier to remember by its common name, which is Bleeding Heart. And you can see why it's called Bleeding Heart, because it has uh, flowers that are in the shape of a pink heart and uh, with other parts of the, uh, of the floral parts dri dripping out uh, below, looking as if they might be blood. Uh, a, a, f a fun common name for it is Lady in the Bath because if you ease the floral parts uh, away you can see a lady sitting there in a nice pink bath spreading her arms enjoying a good soak in the evening. It is a common woodland plant, commonly grown. Uh, it's rather surprising the family it belongs to because it belongs to the poppy family, Papaveraceae, and the flowers don't look like poppies at all, but certainly the leaves look as if they could be uh, a poppy. It's a, it's a great plant to grow in a woodland setting. We've now come into the Fouch Rock Garden, which is a relatively new feature created in the garden some years ago to experiment in developing an alpine rockery. Uh, an alpine rockery being one where we would grow uh, many of the tiny uh, plants that live in rocky crags and places in the higher mountains of the world. Here we have a, a large collection, a couple of hundred species, uh, grown from seed or collected by our staff in, in the Rockies, in the Alps, uh, in the Caucasus Mountains of Western Asia, and from uh, wonderfully wild and craggy places in, throughout Asia uh, and indeed all parts of the world. When we started this, many people were skeptical and saying, you really can't grow alpine plants in St. Louis. Our winters are too cold and wet. Uh, summers are too hot and dry. But we've experimented and we have managed to grow a really very diverse range of of plant species from all over the world from these rocky habitats of the northern hemisphere uh, and many of them are doing very well indeed and I love it in spring because they all come into bloom and they are many of them are tiny but they have just wonderful flowers and wonderful interest to examine them closely uh, please come and have a look at some of my um, the ones that I, I like most and are, are most interesting in the collection here Many of you will know the columbine or the aquilegia from your own gardens, the tall herbaceous plant which has these wonderful flowers that uh, my mother used to call granny's bonnets because they're like an old fashioned bonnet that a grandmother would wear. But this alpine one is from the Pyrenees of Spain and is very dwarfed uh, and does so well in this habitat here. It's dwarfed because, of course, the high mountain habitats where it occurs in the Pyrenees between Spain and France are uh, pretty rough and to survive winter it needs to be tough uh, and it keeps its head down because of the winds uh, blowing up through the mountains. One of the great ways of growing alpine plants in your own gardens is to have these troughs uh, where you can have 
a really great diversity of species in a very tiny area. And I think they look really, um, really well. And there is, you can sit and look at the close up at some of the alpine plants that are growing and coming into flower in, in, the, in the spring. And you can see how in a small space like this, you can fit in eight or nine or 10 little alpine plants and create your own alpine rockery just in these containers. These little trees, uh, the dwarf birch, Betula nana, is one of the most northerly trees found anywhere in the world. And you're seeing it here in what I could describe as uh, St. Louis's only little piece of tundra because the, this tree grows no more than three feet tall, sometimes a lot less than that, and is a, a tiny leaved uh, birch, which is characteristic of the high Arctic regions, gets further north than almost any other tree. And it grows, surprisingly, it grows very well here in the Fouch Rock Garden. This is a house leek which is um, glories in the name Sempervivum Tectorum. Uh, Sempervivum is Latin, uh, which means that it lives forever. Well, more or less it does, because it is extremely difficult to kill. It will grow in dry places. Uh, in many in ancient times throughout Europe, many people would grow the house leek on tops of their houses, because the Romans thought that it kept the house uh, free from being hit by lightning. Uh, and in no parts of northern Europe, it was a talisman against uh, the house going up in flames. Uh, it's house leek. It was used for a lot of different medicinal purposes. Uh, and it also has an alternative name. Well, two. One is called, I think, um, uh, uh, fox and cubs where because it produces lots of little ones around the main rosette. But the one that I like most is the common name in Britain and Ireland, which is called Welcome Home Husband, no matter how drunk you are. Because the story is that if you uh, took some leaves and chewed them after an evening in the pub, when you got home, uh, the, the chewing of the leaf would disguise the aroma of alcohol. I can't tell you if it works. I've never tried it myself. Uh, but, um, but uh, it is edible, so you could feel free to try it yourself if you have it growing at home. One of the best plants to grow in a rock garden like this are the little dwarf irises. Uh, many of them occur in uh, mountain ranges and Mediterranean habitats where they get pl plenty of moisture in spring, and then as the summer comes, uh, the habitat dries out and they retreat underground to their rhizome and uh, sit, sit tight in the summer until they can uh, come up again the next spring and produce their exquisite iris flowers. We have various species here from, from the Caucasus, from Turkey, from uh, the European regions, uh, and in blues and yellows. And there's a great variety f for you to grow in your gardens. And all of them do well, or many of them do well, in the St. Louis environment. This is a great native plant from uh, this region, which uh, grows so well in this rock garden. It is Clematis fremontii, uh, Fremont's leather flower. And it's, um, it is a herbaceous Clematis species. The, the Clematis, we most of us think of them as being climbing plants. But this one has a slightly unusual uh, closed type flower and very pretty does well in, this, in these conditions. This rock rose, Helianthemum numularium, is a beautiful rock garden plant with the yellow flowers that look as if, almost as if they are flowers of a strawberry. It clambers across the rocks. This one is native to, to Europe, and indeed it may, it may also grow in North America. I need to check that. But it does very well. Uh, flowers profusely during the spring and um, spreads nicely, not too much, in a rock garden like this. Here we have the exquisite little uh, Gentiana acolis, a blue-flowered gentian that is native to the Pyrenees between France and Spain. It produces these large flowers, which are sometimes about the size of the, 
the rosette of leaves that it comes from. Gentiana acaulis means, acaulis means a short stem, so the flowers are very close to the rosette of leaves. The, the, the flowers will last three or four days in a rock garden like this, and it does very well. This is a peony, peony tenuifolia. Uh, tenu the leaves are attenuated, they're very narrow, and is probably the earliest flowering peonies that you'll find in any garden. This one has been cultivated in gardens since the uh, 15th, 16th century and is one that would turn up in European mythology associated with medicinal plants and, uh, and beauty. Uh, and it is, um, sometimes I've seen this one carved onto gravestones because it is symbolic of remembrance, I think. Um, and uh, they are beautiful flowers. They are herbaceous, they die down in winter and then come up and bloom in the spring. Uh, this one has red flowers, but you find other species of peony with pink and whites, and then the tree peonies. Uh, some of them are in bloom in the Japanese garden at the moment. And then the, the generally the herbaceous peonies will follow uh, in a week or so. I think uh, going around the Japanese garden the other day, I saw one or two that were in bud and ready to burst forth but this one will have gone by the time they are in, in full bloom. Many of you will know that the mission of the Missouri Botanical Garden includes the care and conservation of many of the world's threatened plant species. We probably have between 12 and 1500 endangered species in cultivation in the garden, many of which are dying out in the wild. And this is one of the species that we're growing here and maintaining as part of a conservation effort for the species. It is uh, a rhizimum uh, hungaricum. It's a, a plant uh, from Central Europe and is disappearing in the wild. And if we have backup collections of it in places like the Missouri Botanical Garden, it will survive for the future. We also have seeds of it in our seed bank. Thank you very much for spending time with me here at the Missouri Botanical Garden. I have enjoyed showing you some of the wonderful plants that we have in the collections and telling you some of the stories that intrigue me about them. We certainly look forward to when we can have you back here in the Missouri Botanical Garden in person. Thank you for all of the support you give to us. We could not do uh, what we do without having your support and having your participation. It is so much appreciated. It is your garden and one that we are tending and caring for diligently while uh, you cannot be here to see it. Thank you and take care. Bye.